Tonight, squeezed between too much war and not enough rain, Somalia struggles to feed its most vulnerable. 50-year-old Rune Mohammed Abdi hasn't witnessed a worse drought than this one, but this plot, she says, is helping her find a way through it. Margaret Evans is on the ground where there are seeds of hope. In Alberta, new premier, new legislature, and a brand new bill. Are the politics any different? The act is a first step in standing up for Albertans and pushing Ottawa back into its own lane. Christmas trees under pressure from the climate, growers and buyers. We have to come today because yeah. they're going to be yeah. gone. This is The National with Chief Correspondent Adrian Arsenault. Thank you for being with us. As we speak tonight, untold numbers of people in Somalia are trying to make it to there tomorrow. The country is on the brink of famine, dealing with the worst drought it's seen in decades. So Somalia has now missed five rainy seasons in a row, and the next one isn't in sight. Where there is no water, there is no food. And for the too many without food, survival is an hour-by-hour -hour fight. Again tonight, you'll meet people at the heart of this crisis. Their stories, difficult to see and hear, but they demand to be watched and heard. And that's why Margaret Evans and a CBC News crew went there to report on the desperation and the small rays of hope in its midst. Tonight, she takes us to a community near the border with Ethiopia. Somalia, a hard scrabble of a place at the best of times. 30 years of conflict taking their toll. Here, Ethiopian soldiers from across the border search cars entering the town of Luke. Worried about attacks by the militant Islamist group Al-Shabaab. Add in the worst drought in half a century and you're in trouble. 60-year-old Abdullahi Hassan knows it. If it continues like this, he tells us, I don't expect we'll be alive in 10 days. He's never run from drought before, but this one is different. We thought some of the animals would survive, he says, of the farm he left behind. When they didn't, we fled for dear life. Now he's one of climate change's dispossessed, living in a camp outside Luke with four grandchildren to feed and a fifth in hospital with severe malnutrition. The harsh reality is that even if a family can get help for a severely malnourished child, they've got other hungry mouths to feed at home and sometimes can feel compelled to sell the fortified food they've been given for a baby or a toddler to feed everybody else. Hassan traded theirs for rice. At the hospital, his daughter says her own hunger makes it hard to produce milk for her son. In town, you need money for food, she says. There is food and commerce in the market if you can afford it, but prices have doubled. This shopkeeper says the newly displaced beg him for food every day, a pressure on the town. An emergency on this scale leaves little time for building resilience. But there are some seeds of hope. Sprouting on the banks of the river circling the city, the one drawing people here. It's a project offering women a small plot of land and the chance to plant drought-resistant crops. 50-year-old Rune Mohammed Abdi hasn't witnessed a worse drought than this one. But this plot, she says, is helping her find a way through it. We've passed through difficult times, she says, but I'm better now because we're getting some food from this farm. Ask her about climate change, and she says it's not the planet or God's will that has changed, but the people living on it. Clearly, Margaret, so much aid is needed, but is it the case that, that some are worried that the security problems are going to cause the donors to think twice? Yeah, well, that's certainly what people in Somalia are worried about, that, that people are going to give up on the country because, you know, it has this reputation of 
constantly being on the verge of becoming a failed state. And of course, there are the problems with Al-Shabaab in recent weeks, months and years. But the message from aid agencies on the ground and from civil society is, yes, it's a troubled country, but all the more reason not to give up on it and to help it. And that there are still hopeful ways of doing that. We, for example, visited an outreach center in one of these big displaced people camps. They don't have medical care, but doctors come once a week. You know, they're measuring the arms of babies. It's like an early warning system in the community. They're talking to mothers and this stuff matters. It can prevent suffering and it can save lives. All right, Margaret, thank you once again. And Margaret's going to join us again a little later to talk through more of what she's seen in Somalia, some of the details that are hard to capture on camera. We will also speak with Canada's Minister of International Development about what this country is doing to help. Now, former Alberta Premier Jason Kenney said tonight he's resigning his seat in the legislature and leaving politics. It happened just as his successor took her seat for the first time. Danielle Smith became party leader with some tough talk around Alberta sovereignty. And tonight, she tried to make good. Erin Collins shows us what happened. I move first reading of Bill 1, the Alberta Sovereignty Within the United Canada Act. What's in a name? When it comes to a law, sometimes a lot. This one makes a quick turn from Alberta sovereignty to a united Canada. No contradiction for Alberta's premier. Let it be clear. Nothing in this bill involves separation. Danielle Smith's signature policy pitched as a way for Alberta to stand up to Ottawa to reject federal laws it disagrees with. We are finally telling the federal government, no more. It's time to stand up for Alberta. Bill 1, the Alberta Sovereignty Within a United Canada Act, is a first step in standing up for Albertans and pushing Ottawa back into its own lane. If the act passes, Alberta's government will have a framework to formally push back against laws it deems as federal overreach or bad for the province. But will it have teeth? It feels like more of a political statement than actually changing the legal landscape. This is really, we're going to be doing the same thing that we've already been doing, which is pretty aggressively uh, bringing reference cases and seeking legal opinions. The act will respect Canada's courts, the Constitution and First Nations treaties. In Ottawa, seemingly little worry about Alberta's Sovereignty Act. Just going to stay focused on the things that matter to Albertans, whether it's affordability, whether it's creating jobs, whether it's working, uh, working constructively to fight climate change and grow a better future. That's what Albertans are focused on, that's what I'm going to stay focused on. As winter settles in, that may be a good plan for Alberta's Premier, too. A spring election is just months away here, and many Albertans have yet to warm to Danielle Smith. Smith has to try to keep her uh, leadership supporters happy on the one hand, while still appealing to mainstream Alberta voters who are suspicious of things like the Sovereignty Act. Still, Alberta's premier says her cabinet is gearing up for a scrap, drafting special resolutions to fight federal laws as early as this spring. Aaron, do, do we know which federal laws Alberta might be targeting with this legislation? But Adrian, it's not clear right now, but I think it's fair to say that there's a bunch of solid candidates for this. So, of course, there's Bill C-69, the um, so-called No More Pipelines Act. Obviously, that rankles a lot of folks out here in Alberta. That could certainly be on the list of things that Premier Smith might go after. And then there's Bill C-21, that expansion of, the, uh, of, of Canada's gun ban. That's also obviously got some gun owners here in Alberta upset. Another possible target. All right, Aaron Collins in Calgary. Thanks, Aaron. Okay, we need a national perspective here. So let's go to Chief Political Correspondent Rosie Barton. Rosie, what's the response in Ottawa? Adrian, Alberta's premier might be looking for a useful cudgel ahead of Alberta's spring election, but Ottawa really doesn't want to be a participant. You heard as much from the prime minister there in Aaron's piece, and that's really all you're going to hear uh, from Ottawa for now. They say, listen, we've worked with Premier Jason Kenney on issues of concern for Albertans, and we can do it again here. So the hope for now is that any debate on the sovereignty bill remains firmly inside of Alberta. So there has to be, though, some political risk for, for Ottawa to take that approach. 
Yeah, you bet. Ottawa runs the risk of seeming, for instance, as though it's not hearing the concerns of Alberta, and that risk applies to other provinces pushing on issues of jurisdiction as well. Uh, Premier Scott Moe in Saskatchewan is a good example. He tabled a bill to protect its natural resources from interference from Ottawa. Quebec continues to push for more powers. And then there's the issue that's crucial everywhere and is proving difficult to solve right now, healthcare transfers and reform. And that's really where the risk is shared by all levels of government, both levels here. Canadians' patience for jurisdictional disputes is pretty limited, and health care is well beyond that limit. All right, Rosie, thanks. Always great to get your insights. Thanks, Adrian. Two earthquakes shook northern Alberta today, just over an hour apart. They were both centered near Reno, that's close to Peace River, about four and a half hours northwest of Edmonton. The strongest of the two is recorded as a magnitude 5.8. Now, if that holds true, it will be the most significant natural earthquake ever recorded in the province. No damage so far has been reported. The three members of Quebec's Parti Québécois caucus are in political limbo tonight, unable to take their seats in the new National Assembly. Ça donne aussi du poids à ces solutions-là vis-à-vis un gouvernement. So this is happening because they refuse to swear an oath to the king. That is a legal requirement after an election. Other parties support changing the law to make the oath optional. Until then, the PQ is asking the new speaker if there's some way to let them in. Now, the founder of the far-right group Oath Keepers was convicted today of seditious conspiracy in connection with the January 6 attack on the U.S. Capitol. The jury heard that Stuart Rhodes started preparing an armed rebellion just after Donald Trump lost the 2020 election. He stood trial along with four other members of the group. One of them convicted also on the sedition charge. Rhodes faces up to 20 years in prison. Authorities in China are working to keep a lid on unrest. With reports, they're tracking down protesters. But as Lisa Xing shows us, demonstrations are spreading even beyond China's borders. Police in hazmat suits in this Chinese city struggle to contain citizens daring to break out of lockdown. But in bigger cities like Shanghai and Beijing, a heavy presence seems to be curbing demonstrations, with reports police are tracking down protesters for statements. The government blamed local officials for being overzealous in implementing zero-COVID policies. Now it's easing some COVID restrictions, though no mention of the protests. The unrest across China has sparked gatherings around the world in solidarity including at China's consulate in Toronto. Our comrades back there in China mainland, they are risking much, much more than we are here. Some who protested over the weekend are afraid to have their identity revealed. Why come out and speak out about it, um, even though there is a bit of that fear still? I was empowered by those um, brave people, brave citizens um, that are protesting in China now. They want to send a message of their own. There is a pandemic going on in China, but it is not COVID-19 pandemic. It is a disease of a bureaucracy that, that's built in, in this institution. People are uh, growing increasingly impatient. That impatience, as COVID continues to spread, raises pressure on the Chinese government to find a solution. How to quickly get more vulnerable people vaccinated and protected and then um, lift the restrictions. Um, that is really what the government need to think about. China has announced it's speeding up vaccinations for the elderly and launching a campaign to fight vaccine hesitancy. It's not clear if that's enough to quell the anger that's been simmering for years. Lisa Xing, CBC News, Toronto. Spain has returned stowaways to a ship they used to make a harrowing journey from Nigeria to the Canary Islands. So three men were found perched precariously on top of the rudder of this tanker just above the waterline. The tanker left Lagos nearly two weeks ago. Officials sent two stowaways back to the ship and intend to deport them. The third is still recovering in hospital. Ukraine is urging NATO to accept the country as a full member of the alliance, with a top Kyiv official saying the past nine months of war have made their case clear. We have a very concentrated understanding of what security is when you're deprived of your basic rights, basic freedoms, electricity, water, basic needs. 
Millions of Ukrainians are trapped in Russia's dark, frigid hold every night. The biggest problem is uh, no water because we can't uh, wash kids. Some of these hardships mirrored on the front lines. There hasn't been much movement in recent weeks. The mud still hasn't frozen over. The forces are bogged down in cold sludge. So many are digging in and training for terrifying battles to come. As Chris Brown shows us, both the military situation and the needs of ordinary Ukrainians were top of the agenda at a NATO summit. Much of Kyiv is still in darkness. Electricity and water are intermittent. Russia released new footage of its jets preparing for yet more bombing runs on Ukraine as it makes no secret that its intention is to destroy the country's means to stay warm and keep the lights on. And so, as NATO's foreign ministers met in neighboring Romania, Ukraine's minister came with a shopping list. In a nutshell, patriots and transformers is what Ukraine needs the most. Patriots are arguably NATO's most advanced anti-missile system, requiring large crews and lots of training, and the answer is still maybe. Although NATO has bolstered supplies of some of the other long-range rockets Ukraine has asked for. As for more help with energy, that NATO says it will do. We have delivered uh, generators, we have uh, delivered spare parts, uh, and, uh, and allies are in different ways helping uh, to rebuild <coughs> the destroyed infrastructure. We know that we will make sure that we continue to support Ukraine. The wife of President Vladimir Zelensky, Elena, came to London to say thank you and to push for a new war crimes court to punish the Russian leadership after Ukraine wins. The world will be able to thank Britain for not only helping to stop evil on the battlefield, but also for helping to restore justice by condemning and punishing this evil. Russian propagandists have clearly been thinking about that possibility and scoffing at it. A panelist on state TV said if Russia loses, even the janitor who sweeps up the Kremlin could be charged with war crimes. G7 justice ministers agreed to expedite plans to set up tribunals to prosecute suspected cases of atrocities by Russian troops. But that could take years. The more immediate concern is getting Ukrainians through this winter. Chris Brown, CBC News, London. Alfonso Davies made history when he scored Canada's first ever men's World Cup goal. Well, today the soccer star relived that magic moment at a news conference in Doha. I looked to my left and I just saw my teammates running towards me. And uh, yeah, it was a great feeling, you know. Um, you know, you, you, we've waited for this moment for, you know, for a long time and, and uh, it finally came and we we're, were happy. Davies says his parents were in the stadium saying it was a proud day for them as well. The family fled civil war in Liberia and Davies was born in a refugee camp in Ghana before coming to Canada. When I scored a goal, you know, my mom teared up a little bit, you know, seeing, seeing her, her son, you know, coming from a refugee camp, coming to Canada and being able to score on the world's biggest stage, you know, she'll, they're all proud of me. So Canada cannot advance to the next round of the World Cup, but Davies says the team will push hard in its final game against Morocco this Thursday. Well, tonight, FIFA is investigating the game that eliminated Canada from the World Cup. But as Thomas Daigle explains, the issue isn't what happened on the soccer field, but in the stands. Goalkeeper Milan Borjan didn't want to make a fuss. But now Canada's Soccer Association is picking a fight for him. All because of these Team Croatia fans, troublemakers sitting behind Borjan during Canada's match, taunting him using a word for pro-Nazi fascist. We're like, man, they're they are yelling stuff at him. We can't understand it, but they're on Borean all game. But once I realized and someone educated me about what this was about, I was, I was pretty shocked. Some even got a hold of Borean's cell phone number, inundating him with 2,500 insult-filled texts. And then there's this flag, brought to the stadium by Croatia supporters to target Borean personally with the logo of tractor maker John Deere. A vile attack in reference to Borjan's Serbian roots in a region of Croatia, 
Amid war in the 90s, his family fled like many others, some using tractors to get away. He kind of educated on it, us on it a little bit before the game. We, we kind of knew what, we were, what he was going to go through in that game, and of course we, we told him we're behind you. Now FIFA says it's launched a disciplinary case against Croatia's soccer federation over the behavior of its fans. And we call for the fans and every individual to not to behave in that manner. Serbian soccer officials are also having to answer to FIFA after this locker room picture surfaced showing a map of Serbia annexing independent Kosovo. A reminder of the deep historical tensions in the Balkans with Canada's goalkeeper just the latest target. Borian staying silent since Canada soccer launched its complaint. Croatia's soccer federation could face a fine over the incident. FIFA's disciplinary committee hasn't said how long it might take to issue a ruling. Thomas Dag, CBC News, Umsalal, Qatar. If you're about to start your holiday decorating with a tree purchase, get ready for higher prices and shorter supply. We have to come today because yeah. they're going to be yeah. gone. What's behind an industry-wide issue? Next. A remote First Nation facing mounting bills just to keep the lights on. It's going to be very difficult to be able to stay here. We don't want to see people have to leave. Coming up, why this Ontario community is forced to buy power from south of the border. And a little later. For those struggling to get by an act of kindness. I'm really happy that I can make people smile. The nine-year-old just trying to make the world a better place, one care package at a time. We're back in two. The National, voted Canada's best national newscast. Canada's biggest bank is making history tonight with that industry's biggest deal ever. RBC is buying HSBC Canada for $13.5 billion in cash. If the deal meets government approval, RBC will gain 130 branches, nearly 800,000 new customers, just a small fraction of what it already has. This news comes as Canada's economy continues to dodge a recession. New numbers show the GDP grew by a meager 0.7% in September. That's still more than expected, thanks in part to a surge in oil sands extraction. This was the fifth straight month of GDP growth, defying talk of a recession, at least for now. But the signs of a slowdown are still everywhere. Household spending dropped in September for the first time in more than a year, and the overall rate of growth was down. Well, tonight, there are new concerns about a nationwide Christmas tree shortage. Increased demand is part of the problem, but so is extreme weather. And as Cam McIntosh explains, the short supply is already driving up prices. That might be the one. Should There's a tag on this side. There is? Yeah. Right here. What, is, what size do we got there? What does it say? Uh, 10 to 12 balsam fir. Okay. Does when you know, this one better, you know. I like, like that one because it's big. It was just opened last weekend. I know. I know. That's why she said we have to come today yeah. because they're going to yeah. be gone. Devin Penner's family is getting a jump on buying a tree. You need something big, full. That's a look good. Um, the trees, the fig trees just don't do it. Tree farmer Dan Friesen has enough trees for now. They're real, just not local. Three years ago, a bad frost killed off what would have been this year's crop. So he's bringing trees in, but not as many as he'd like. I have trees right now that are, are moving up in size. If I could uh, get them to grow a little faster, that would be great. Turns out the hunt for the perfect tree may be a little more challenging for most with a tree shortage across much of North America. Friesen's farm, just one example of extreme weather hitting the industry hard over the last few years. While COVID drove such demand, the last two Christmases, many farmers overcut. I certainly don't encourage anyone to panic buy. But say tree growers, it may not be the time to be picky. I'm asking you to step out of your comfort zone. So if you're not necessarily uh, getting the Fraser fir that you want, try one of the other species. What is getting shipped out is more expensive. Prices up 15 to 20%. Our fertilizer costs doubled this year, and of course fuel has been way up, and labor is more expensive. What are they saying when they see the tag this year? You know what, it's, it's quite interesting. 
Christmas is one of the things that people are not going to cut back too much. <laughs> Certainly not in this case. There you are, folks. Big tree, right. big smiles to go along with that maybe more elusive holiday feeling of finding just the right one. Cameron McIntosh, CBC News, near Steinbach, Manitoba. Coming up after the break, we return to our top story tonight, Somalia on the brink of famine. After the break, I'll speak with our Margaret Evans about what she and her team have witnessed on the ground so far and the stories they want the world to pay attention to. Plus, we'll look at what more Canada could do to help. We're returning to our top story tonight. The drought and desperation gripping Somalia right now. Nearly 7 million people are living with food insecurity. Hundreds of thousands are actually facing starvation. Margaret Evans and a CBC News team traveled there to hear their stories firsthand. And earlier, Margaret and I spoke about what she's seen and heard. So, Margaret, it's, it, thank you for making time. Uh, we've been watching your stories. They're, they're hard to watch because they matter and they're important and what's happening there is hard. But, but I also suspect there's, there's a, a lot happening that you haven't been able to get into your stories yet. What's something you want people to know about the people you've met? We met a mother who had eight children. She lost four of them to hunger. And behind her, she had kids, the kids standing behind her. And especially the eldest child, that sense of responsibility that you see in his eyes and his shoulder and all the little ones that he's now responsible in. I think it's, it's quite shocking. And they're seeing this, they're seeing their siblings die, they're seeing their mother unable to sit up because she's hungry herself. Uh, it's, it's, you know, extremely heartbreaking. And, you know, you sent in, um, you sent in some, some pictures. We've been looking at them, and one of them is from an airplane. And you're flying over uh, an IDP camp and it's nestled alongside the edge of, of a runway. And what, what strikes me by looking at it is it's like a city. This is like the scale of a city. And has that, has that been something that, that has surprised you? You've seen so much all over the world, but has that surprised you? Not really, because it, you know, th this drought has already displaced a million people. But it is, it is odd, you know, there's this disconnect because you're flying over it and you seem separate from it. We actually landed there. It's uh, the camp around Baidoa. Um, and uh, from, from the air, it, it looks like gumdrops or marbles scattered across the ground. But when you get there, of course, these are dome-like structures, you know, made out of twigs and rags, and people are living in them with absolutely nothing. You've seen famine before. You've certainly seen drought before. The, dis the distinction here, aside from the scale, is, is what? I mean, this is a country where they can't, they, you know, they mark time by droughts, especially the elderly. They, you know, they actually name the droughts. This one, I asked a couple of people, is apparently called the equalizer because it's so widespread, nobody's going to escape it. Um, the difference is this time, you know, people will say, it, the, the droughts are they're running into each other. You used to be able to have one year of drought, but you knew it would rain the next. But they don't think that way anymore. They don't believe the rain is coming back. They've missed five. They're talking about missing a sixth. And it's the fact that they're not planning on going back. So you have these huge displaced camps coming around the cities and the pressure there, and they can't, they can't support them. But it's fundamentally going to transform the nature of this country because this is a country that is largely pastoralist. So what are you going to do if you can't help people live through these droughts, to live through climate change? And that, I think that is the big, big question down the road. But right now, nobody can think about it because they're trying to save lives. Margaret, thank you. Thank you to, to Lily and, and to Adrian there for, for all the work you've done. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Adrian. So this is all obviously hard to talk about, the, the pictures of little ones in so much distress, those are very hard to see. Figuring out what can be done isn't easy either. We have all sadly been in this spot before. It was in 1984, nearly 40 years ago, that CBC's Brian Stewart was the first journalist in North America to share stories and pictures of the famine in Ethiopia. Incredibly, these people may be regarded as the lucky ones in Northern Ethiopia. They've at least had the strength to make it into a camp. They were heart-stopping moments, 
and the ghosts of Ethiopia seem to haunt the parched earth in Somalia now. To see that then did something, mobilized millions. Good morning, live, eh? Can I... And millions of heartbroken people raised hundreds of millions of dollars. Some of the pictures CBC broadcast then were fundamental to the Live Aid concerts. I'd like to introduce a video made by CBC Television. The subject speaks for itself. Thank you. Good night. Please send your money in. And that concert opened global purse strings and pushed governments to act. But that was then. Other famines have come and gone. But hunger is always an emergency. So what's the world going to do now for Somalia? Where is the shouting from the planet's rooftops? So let's talk with someone who can make a difference. Canada's Minister of International Development, Harjit Sajjan. Thank you, Minister. We have, we've heard tonight that you know, some fear Somalia's security situation is maybe making aid donors think twice right now. Why do you think we are not hearing the loud global anxiety over so many people going hungry? Canada is currently uh, doing its part. Uh, for example, right now, uh, we have allotted approximately $600 million um, uh, on food security systems um, in Africa. 60, but approximately 60 million uh, strictly for Somalia, uh, but also to support the surrounding uh, region. But we have learned lessons uh, from the previous uh, famine. And I visited, uh, for example, uh, the, uh, uh, in Nairobi, some of the research centers where we're actually doing research on uh, better nutritious beans so that the food that is actually going out is more uh, nu nutritious. But I go back to my first question. We're not hearing people screaming from the rooftops. Why do you think that is? I, I, I really can't answer the question for you. I wish there were. I've actually purposely made uh, more visits into, in the region on, uh, focused on uh, the hunger crisis. Not just, um, obviously I couldn't get into Somalia because of the security situation, but I visited South Sudan, uh, Kenya, trying to get the word out. In fact, I actually been working very closely with David Beasley from the World Food Program on, on trying to get this message out. But people do need to know what's taking uh, place. But uh, at the same time, I want to make sure uh, Canadians know that uh, we are stepping up, uh, making sure that we have the funding uh, in place. In fact, just this year alone, because of the hunger crisis, we had an off-cycle budget request that the Prime Minister and the Finance Minister approved that was announced. That was $250 million, and of which $200 million uh, went uh, for food security in the region. But because of the seriousness of what was taking place inside the country is the reason why we increased um, our support. So we do have a plan that can work, but we need to uh, uh, come together uh, as a world, as you were saying, uh, so we can end hunger and meet the sustainable uh, development goals for, uh, for 2030. Minister, thank you so much for your time. We could ask you so many more. We appreciate the time you gave us. Great. Thank you for covering it. There's, of course, much more ahead on the national, including an Ontario First Nation facing a huge challenge just to keep the power on. I've had two power outages where I had to disconnect myself in the middle of treatment. We take you to a remote community dealing with outages and mounting costs. Plus, Canadian wildlife under threat. A new report details the Canadian species at risk of dying out. You might be surprised by what they are. Across Canada, the long, dark days of winter are surely on their way. A time to turn the lights on and keep warm. But for a First Nations community in northern Ontario, that is an incredibly expensive proposition. The community on Windigo Island has fallen through the cracks when it comes to electricity and affordability. Because of its particular location, it has to import power from Minnesota in American dollars. The CBC's Logan Turner now on the impact that's having on residents and what they say needs to change. Good morning, Chief Good Glenn morning. McVicker. Oh, How are you? Good, nice to see you. Nice I'm to excited. see you as well. Only on Lake of the Woods, by boat or ice road, can you get to the remote indigenous community of an Imkiwajing 37 that sits at the point where Ontario meets the borders of Minnesota and Manitoba. 
We're just pulling in to Wendigo Island here, part of Animpi Wajing 37. It's a community of about 50 people and they say they pay some of the highest electricity prices. So we've traveled here more than 80 kilometers by boat to find out why. Why does it cost so much to bring power here? Well, right now um, we have to buy our power from Roseau Electric, which is in Minnesota. The hydro rates are at such a, a, a cost in U.S. dollars that the average person here, the average household, it would be a real hardship. So we do supplement uh, the cost of hydro in the homes. They yeah. have emailed. Chief McVicker says they were never connected to the Canadian grid, in part because of their remote location. But she says now is the time as the bills are adding up. February. March and April 2021. Okay, so this is like winter of last year. Right. And so when we're looking at these bills, like how much how much was January of last year? It was 15478 15,478 US. What goes through your mind when you see such a large number for so few houses? Well, you know, it's going to be hard to it's not sustainable, right? Waters from Lake of the Woods flow north and generates power for both Manitoba and Ontario. But Wendigo Island doesn't get any of that power. And Manitoba just built a new transmission line to export more power to Minnesota. But again, an Jing won't see any of those profits. The problem isn't just affordability, it's also reliability. For Vanessa Powassan, that's a problem. Well, I started dialysis a few weeks ago, and like for me to run my machines and for me to stay home with my family, it's very important to me. How reliable is the power out here? I've only started like three weeks of dialysis, so I've had two power outages where I had to disconnect myself in the middle of treatment. It gives me anxiety a lot. Like when the, I worry about power outages, I worry I'm not going to get my treatment done that week, and. How long can these power outages last for? Uh, I think the most I've seen was five days in the winter time. Five days in the winter time. Yeah. Oh, it's behind this thing here. My son sleeps in here. Oh, okay. No worries. But yeah, that's it. Okay. And so this, this here for two hours. Three and a half hours, three times a week. Right. And so that's three and a half hours hoping that there's no power outage. Yes. I really depend on the power for my health. Chief McVicker says she hears those concerns and that's why she wants to find an affordable and a stable source of power. What options are you looking at in order to reduce the cost of hydro here? Well, we have been talking to Hydro One. We had a long discussion about different options, so it was anywhere from five, ten million dollars to bring hydro underwater to here and then the conversation kind of just ended because, you know, it's a large cost and, and should it be paid for by Indigenous services partly and partly them. And quite honestly, our capacity for all of this talk and jibber jabber about something to me that's a basic right. Indigenous Services Canada and the Ontario government both say they're aware of the concerns and have told the First Nation they want to help, but no one has offered a solution or said who will ultimately foot the bill. So who should pay the five million, the $10 million then? Well, right now I would say Hydro One. I mean, they, they are the hydro supplier in Ontario and we're right in the center of Canada geographically. So I'd, I think it's time. What do you mean by that? We're kind of at a cusp with uh, reconciliation and the recognition that First Nations people, um, you know, they deserve all of the opportunities that settlers have had over generations. So, and that's why I feel like I wanted to talk about it because now is the, the, the critical point where I think, yeah, it, it's going to be very difficult to be able to stay here. We don't want to see people have to leave. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> For people like Vanessa Powassan, this tiny island will always be home, whatever the cost. And so why stay here? It's my home. <laughs> it's where my mom was born and raised. It was where my grandparents were. It's just my daughter 
I lost a daughter in 2002 and she's buried on this island, so I probably will never leave this island because I have to take care of her too while she's here. I'm not gonna leave her. <laughs> We've been here since the treaty signed. It's our home. As another cold, dark winter approaches, the community braces for the return of high bills so they can afford to stay on this island they call home. Logan Turner is now back in Thunder Bay. So Logan, it's been a few weeks since you went to Windigo Island. Has there been any action to address the concerns of the First Nation? Well, our reporting seems to have raised the profile of the issue the very day after we left Windigo Island. I spoke to Chief Linda McVicker and she said that Indigenous Services Canada reached out to her to request a meeting with all of the parties involved to make a plan to address the high electricity costs that this community is facing. But I spoke to Chief McVicker again this afternoon. She told me that in the three weeks since, she hasn't heard any follow-up. And so when I reached her, she was actually in the process of drafting a letter to both the Ontario and federal governments to, to say why hasn't she heard back, to say that this is a huge issue for her community that she wants to see resolved. All right, Logan, thank you. We know you'll stay on it. Thanks. A new report says thousands of species of wildlife in Canada are at risk of going extinct. Once something is gone, it is gone forever. Coming up, what exactly is vanishing and why scientists say we all need to pay attention? Plus... A Winnipeg girl's act of kindness in our moment. Well, apparently there's trouble for some of Canada's wild things. A new report on the country's biodiversity is warning that more than 2,000 species are at high risk of being wiped out. As Susanna De Silva tells us, the biggest blow could come from losing some of the smallest. It's just not in Canada anymore. In little boxes and in little envelopes. On Haida Gwaii, we had a rare species. Are samples of the most threatened creatures in the country. It's just found on this one cliff face. Yeah. And one Scientists at UBC's Biodiversity Museum have catalogued around 2 million specimens, including many of the 80,000 species found in Canada. A new report says many of them are under threat. Extinction is a very chilling word. Once something is gone, it is gone forever. Every five years, Canada tries to add to its catalogue of species and see how they're doing. Researchers don't have enough information about many, but those they do know about, the news isn't good. One in five species are at risk of extinction in Canada, which points to the urgent need for action. And while larger animals like whales or marmots garner the most attention, the vast majority of species threatened are either insects, plants, mosses and lichen. So they're disproportionately affected by human activities uh, based on what we're seeing in this report. Biologist Toby Sprobilla specializes in lichen. There are um, uh, flying squirrels, uh, which uh, use it for um, nesting material, and uh, a lot of birds, if you've ever seen a hummingbird nest, hummingbirds use it for nesting material, and it's very, very well integrated into uh, the ecosystem. A point scientists at UBC hope their museum can help people understand. We don't really have enough understanding to say, well, we can afford to lose 5%, 10%, 15%. At some point, the whole system collapses, and we don't know enough to even know where that point is. The federal government has committed to protecting 30% of Canada's lands and oceans by the next decade. They're halfway there right now. But scientists are worried by then, more species in Canada will only be found in museums like this. Susanna the Silva, CBC News, Vancouver. Now this little one is nine. She's just nine, but do not underestimate Grace Kennedy. This is a child on a mission to make kindness contagious. So she's been creating care packages of sorts to bring to people who are experiencing homelessness in Winnipeg. This is an idea she says she thought of all on her own, and tonight her act of kindness is our moment. We are going to do bread, mustard, cheese, lettuce, turkey, right? Okay. Let's do it, girl. My name is Grace Kennedy. I'm nine years old. I was just watching a bunch of YouTube videos and I, I just had the idea. I told it to my mom and she agreed. We're going to try to make care packages and we're, and we're going to give them to the people who don't have a home at the shelters. These are fun Thank days. you. They were just so happy. The woman said that it reminded her of the sandwiches that she had when she was a kid that her mom made her. How does it feel to, to receive a care package? 
Feels pretty damn good. <laughs> I'm really happy that I can make people smile. Thank you. It makes me feel like, like maybe I can make the world a bit of a better place. Like maybe I can encourage more people to help. Like if they watch us. We've already done that, Grace. So one gentleman uh, who was, she was assisting there, said that he really liked her idea of putting socks in the bag, that that was something that was really important. So she's learning every time she does this, and she wants, again, to make this contagious good honor. That is a national for November the 29th. Thank you for being with us. Have a good night.